Hello and welcome to our deep dive into the world of software design principles. I am Abhinash Mishra and today we are going to unravel the mysteries of the solid design principles in an exciting three part series. In the first part, we will lay the groundwork with a theoretical understanding of solid, what it stands for and why it is cornerstone in modern software development. This will give you a solid foundation and clarity on these principles. In the next segment, we will roll up our sleeves for the second part where we dive into practical hands-on coding examples. Here, you will see the solid principles come to life as we refactor and improve real code snippet in different programming languages. It is all about applying theory to practice. And for the third series, third segment, we are going to simulate an interview scenario, whether you are aspiring to be, an, to be on the interviewer side or interviewee side of the table, this section will equip you, equip you with insight and strategies to handle discussion around solid principles effectively in interviews. So buckle up for the insightful journey through the realm of solid design. Solid and design principles are instrumental in crafting robust, maintainable and scalable software. These principles when understood and applied judiciously offer a roadmap to both novices and veterans in the software development industry. So this segment of the video aims to demystify these principles and explore their practical application in various roles within a project team. So the first question always comes to our mind, why are solid principles important? Solid principles lay the foundation for efficient software design. Following these principles ensures that software systems are easier to understand, modify and extend thus reducing the cost of software maintenance. They also facilitate better collaboration among team members by providing common design language. So after understanding why, let's focus on what. Okay. So what are the SOLID principles? SOLID is an acronym representing five design principles and the first design principle from S, S stands for SRP single responsive principle. A class should have only one reason to change, meaning it should only have one job or responsibility. Correct? O stands for OCP, open closed principles. Software entities like classes, modules, functions, etc. should be open for extension but closed for modification. The third principle is L stands for list scope substitution principle LSP. Objects of superclass should be replaceable with objects of its subclass without affecting the correctness of the program. I stands for interface segregation principle. Clients should not be forced to depend upon interface they do not use. D stands for dependency inversion principle, DIP. High level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstraction. And this is these are the five standard design principles is the part of solid design principle. And I am going to explain you these all part, these all five parts separately one by one in the coming segment. Before going into detail with code example, let me put some senior level folks take away from solid design principles. If you are an architect or senior developer role, as an architect or developer, the solid principles guide you in creating systems that are not only functional, but also adaptable to change. By following SRP, for instance, you create smaller, more focused classes, making the system easier to debug and extend. OCP encourages you to think ahead and design your system in a way that new functionality can be added with minimal changes to existing code. If you are an engineering leadership role, engineering leaders play a pivotal role, main role in ensuring that their teams understand and apply solid principles effectively. This would encourage a culture of continuous learning and code reviews where these principles are discussed and evaluated. This not only maintains code quality, but also helps in mentoring less experienced team members. So these principles and this process must be followed in your organization or in, I mean to say in every organization in especially when your organization is building some kind of multi-year software products. So before going to deep dive into the principles, let me warn you the pitfalls of blindly following solid design principle. While the solid design principle are powerful, Applying them blindly without considering the specific context of your project can lead to our engineering. It is essential to strike a balance between adhering to, between following these principles and keeping the design simple and pragmatic. What kind of precaution must be taken before the application of design principles followed? 
development team members must be vigilant to avoid misinterpretation and misuse of these principles by regularly reviewing design choices and refactoring when it seems necessary. Stay updated with emerging design patterns and practices. Understand the specific needs and constraints of the project to avoid unnecessary complexity within your project development scope. Hi, welcome back. So let's try to understand now um, our um, different design principles one by one. Look at this uh, diagram, these two diagrams here. The left side diagram is actually a user settings case, I mean, uh, yeah, user setting class case which violates the SRP. If you look at the left side UML, you will see that user setting class is handling two things together. One is user setting, another is persistence of this user setting, I mean, uh, saving of this into the database. This dual functionality means changes in either logic would uh, do the modification in the same class, right? Meaning that uh, when you do this uh, uh, user setting change, it will uh, change the class same class which is also responsible for saving and that's why this is violating the SRP. Now look at the another next UML, right side UML where you can see that uh, you what you did, you just separated out one responsibility given to user setting manager and another responsibility given to user setting repository class, right? Now user setting class, user settings class is primarily maintaining the managing the all user setting and another class which is uh, user setting repository which is primarily dealing with the all persistency, persistency or saving requirement for this user setting into the database. So by this separation, now your class is compliant with SRP single responsive principle. Now your class is only going to change, like a user setting class only change when actually user setting need to be, I mean, require the change or your user setting repository class will only change when you need to do some modification in saving of your user setting case to the database, right? That's why now both class is doing their own responsibility separately, right? This is what we should follow in single responsive principle. All right, welcome back. So in the last discussion, we covered SRP single responsibility principle. Now in this case, we are supposed to discuss about the open close principle, okay? So let's discuss, uh, let's let's see the two UML diagram shared to you. One is, which is the left side, and this is a violation of OCP principle, and the right side, which was the compliance with OCP principle. Now let me explain you how, how it is violating and why it is compliant, okay? So let's try to understand um, the left side um, UML diagram, and the class is area calculator class which directly checks the type of each shape like a circle and calculate the area accordingly. Now the problem here is this design requires modifying area calculator every time a new shape is added, making it open to modification which goes against the OCP principle. In the another side of UML which is a compliance version here, area calculator works with an I shape interface and each shape like circle or rectangle or anything else implements this interface with its own calculate area method. And that approach, which is the compliance one, allows new shape to be added without changing area calculator, make it open for extension. Adding new shape is allowed without modifying the existing classes, right? So it means that it is following the OCP, open for uh, extension, closed for modification. That is certified in this approach, right? That's why I'm saying that the right UML, uh, which is uh, this side UML, is definitely, definitely uh, compliant with OCP principle, but the left side, which is uh, which is uh, to be modified, uh, like calculate area class would be modified for every addition of new shape, which is uh, actually a violating the close for modification concept. So that is, that's why it is violating the OCP mm -hmm. principle. I hope you are now clear about what kind of violation happening here and how this violation can be rectified by a small tweaking in their structure. All right, so here is Liskov's substitution principle, right? Conceptually, I can define it like objects in a program should be replaceable with instance of their subtype without altering the correctness of, the, of that program. Let me explain to you the violation of the LSP in this example. So in this example, look at the uh, your UML diagram here. In this UML diagram, you can see that uh, you have a rectangle class and you have a square class. A square is derived from a square is derived from rectangle, right? Now, 
rectangle class has uh, two member variables width and height and one method which is get area and in the derived class we have a similar two methods uh, set height and set width as the base class has also set height and set width and then get area now here is one special properties of a square it has equal sides meaning uh, if you know the width you don't require height after that because you know that uh, a square have height and width equal right so if you are aware of width you don't require to uh, again find what is the width in that in in, in that shape in that shape right a square shape but in case of rectangle width and height are different that's why these two methods have their own values now if you look at this structure like a uh, rectangle derived uh, i mean base class and derived class as a square now due to this special difference between these two class you quickly understood that you can quickly understand here that square class can't be a replacement of rectangle class exactly right because their structure their functionality is changing and this is a violation of lsp so in this kind of a structure class hierarchy can't be treated as a lsp compliant now how do you make this this structure as a lsp compliant but for making this LS, lsp compliance there is a small tweak requirement if you remember i already shared you that the one key solution or one diamond rule always in this these kind of scenarios is the abstraction create abstraction layer just like that we have to create here a uh, abstract class which is called shape and this shape have one method which is get area and this shape class have now two children one is square another is rectangle rectangle have two member variables width and height and other thing is like rectangle set width set height and then get area similarly a square do not require two variables two member variables because it has only one variables is sufficient for case of uh, square so here you just take one variable which is side and there is a another method which is set side instead of set width and height here is a set side and then get area need to be derived now look at this structure and in this case you will see that the base class and derived class have same functionality same matching structure like if you compare it with shape get area you will see that this get area is exactly replaceable there is no uh, i mean change with this this from the derived class structure and that's the uh, that's the requirement of our uh, this parent base base class and derived class hierarchy so in in that case i would say that this i mean structure like abstract shape class and then child like a rectangle and a square are lsp compliant so i think this is the fundamental like there is a key rule in most of the problem where you will see that the gap or there is any design principle fail violation one time you must think about the abstract approach like can we introduce abstract class abstract interface or interface class by which we can uh, avoid this kind of situation which is creating a principle design principle fail case scenario right so that is what i am expecting here in this case so you just do this thing and you will see that most of the time this abstraction or interface uh, bringing these things in 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 your uh, structure will help you to resolve the current uh, violation scenario i hope you are clear now discuss isp interface segregation principle clients should not be forced to depend on interfaces they do not use let's see our uh, first uml which is the violation case the i workable interface forces its worker the worker class to implement both work and eat method regardless of whether all workers need both functionalities this violates the interface segregation principle which states that no client should be forced to depend on methods it do not use look at the another uml diagram which is the compliance uml the functionalities are split into two interfaces i workable and i eatable interface the workers class implements both but this design allows for more flexibility other classes can choose to implement only one of these interfaces to follow the isp by not imposing unnecessary methods on them so that is considered as a isp compliance that is what we should understand so any structure which is not violating isp or which is violating isp is the way we can understand like any class should not be forced any client should not be forced to implement those interface which they don't used right so that kind of forcing is not supposed to do if it is happening that means you are violating the isp 
so your in that case again your friend is segregate the things in such a way that uh, your class is forced only to implement those interface which they really need it or in which they are supposed to use it that is what you can see in the right side uml diagram where the compliance of isp has shown to you okay i hope it is clear to you all right let's understand dip now high level modules should not depend on low level low level modules and both should depend on abstraction look at the left side uml violates the dip principles because notification directly depends on the concrete class email service this tightly couples notification to email service making it hard to extend or test notification with different messaging service look at the right side uml diagram complies with dip by introducing an interface i message service now email service implements this interface and notification depends on the interface rather than a specific implementation so this allows notification to work with any class that implements i message service making it more flexible and easier to test or modify in future so this loose coupling is very very handy and helpful and again you see that here also the abstraction comes in very handy so like my thumb rule is again right considered as a right because abstraction is most of the scenario abstraction will play a good role so that's why you always think on abstraction side first okay okay i hope by concluding this dip we have already covered all five solid design principles all right so let's conclude now to this video a take away for all for developers architect or engineering leader or a senior management please note the solid design principle are not just rules to follow but tools to achieve excellence in software design they encourage a mindset of continuous improvement and attention to quality however their true power lies in their judicious application tailored to the needs of the projects and the organization so there is no one solution for everything right by embracing these principle thoughtfully teams can build software that not only meets the current needs but it also ready for the challenges of tomorrow so i hope that i am able to justify this discussion thank you thank you for completing this video and i hope that you definitely have learned something which will help you in your system design interview hope to see you in next video with new concept and skills needed for the system design interview by then keep learning keep improving and keep sharing your knowledge